This episode of the Expression Radio podcast was made possible through sponsorship provided by the AIG, the Australian Institute of Geoscientists. To learn more about the AIG, the programs it supports, or to become a member, please go to aig.org.au. That is aig.org.au. The elephant in the room is that the devaluation of mining companies cannot be explained by the commodity price. Instead, it is dictated by the self-inflicted mistakes of a commodity boom and the irresponsible management of these assets. The elephant in the room is that most of these mining companies believe that the commodity boom will continue to bail out their lackadaisical management and operations. The elephant in the room is that the mining companies in the past maximized returns for an ever-rising gold price optimizing project resources for scale rather than payback and returns. The elephant in the room is that the mining industry has made so many mistakes, mistakes in the geological modeling, mistakes in community relations, mistakes in environmental planning, mistakes in capital markets, mistakes in communicating with investors, and mistakes in over-promising and promoting their business. The elephant in the room is that the mining industry has lost the trust of the most serious investors, causing an exodus of capital that will not return quickly. That was John Goodman, President and CEO of Dundee Corporation, a company with a long and successful pedigree investing in the mining and resources industry. John's experience has given him some great insights into the good and the bad of being an investor in mining. He recently wrote an article detailing some of his frustrations around how the industry deals with generalist investors and some of the reasons why, particularly recently, we as an industry have struggled to attract investors. Maybe it's about time we start addressing these elephants in the room. Now, John joined us during the 2020 PDAC conference in March, so our discussion was prior to the current COVID-induced commodity boom we're experiencing. Irrespective of that, I think John's comments address some fundamental structural issues we have in our industry, and the recent boom is simply papering over these cracks. So let's find out what John has to say. My name is Ahmad, and welcome to Exploration Radio. John, welcome to Exploration Radio. Thank you. Usually, we have to search for people for a while to get on the show. You were the exact opposite. We kind of touched base and you were really excited to come on, which is slightly concerning to us, but that's good. (laughs) So I just want to say thanks a lot for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. But it wasn't as fast as you think because I listened to about three hours worth of your podcast before I had the conversation with you. (laughs) Excellent. Good. So just as a start, I guess we wanted to get you to just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are right now. Okay, it's uh, it's actually not that complicated. My name is Jonathan Goodman. I come from a family whose background is the mining industry. My father is Ned Goodman. And when I started to decide on what schools to go to, as a family, we used to be very avid skiers. Mm-hmm. And my father introduced me to the Colorado School of Mines. And I, I went there and I, my plan wasn't to study geological engineering, it was to study mathematics, because that's what I loved at the time. The summer jobs I started getting were in the Yukon in northern Ontario doing geological field work, and I really liked it. So after about a year, I switched my major to, uh, well, you, you didn't have to declare your major for a year, but I, I declared uh, geological engineering and went from there. But I mean, I should say that your family does have a pretty rich pedigree in the mining industry. Your father that you mentioned is an Order of Canada winner. He's mining Hall of Fame recipient, etc. So you have a pretty good understanding of what mining is all about. Yeah, but you still have to learn everything for yourself. This is a complicated business and you know you have to go out there and make a lot of mistakes till you figure out what not to do next time. I think that's a good way to put it, that you have to kind of learn by your mistakes in some ways. Well, I used to say people should invest with me because um, I've made every mistake there was, but I don't say it anymore because you learn new mistakes as you go. So I no longer say that, but we do pride ourselves in doing a lot of due diligence and a lot of deep dive, looking at things before we make an investment. So I think that's a good point. Maybe let's take that point is that your current role is where you essentially are an investor in the industry. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is your kind of views as an investor into this industry. Absolutely. And that's what I want to talk about. So you recently wrote this article called Elephant in the Room. So we'll talk about what that article is. Can you talk a little bit about what motivated you to write that article? So it was clearly motivated by frustration. Mm -hmm. As someone that spent the last 33 years of my life studying the markets, what happened since 2000 and end of 2010, early 2011, 
to now, particularly in the junior mining space, has been devastating. Mm -hmm. And if you go around talking to people, they'll say, well, yeah, metal prices haven't done us any favors. And when you look at it and think about it, well, yeah, maybe metal prices haven't done you any favors. But if you look at the the Australian gold price has been very robust, maybe not the the U.S. dollar gold price, but the Australian gold price has been very healthy. The Canadian dollar gold price has been healthy. Mm -hmm. And you go around the world, look at other currencies. Gold prices have been good in many currencies. They've been misled to think that it's just a business cycle. Business cycles don't knock 70% off of the average stock in a junior sector. So when we saw the gold price start coming up, all of a sudden you start seeing all of these things being put out by self-professed pundits talking about, oh, gold price is up, we're starting a a new cycle, gold's going to go to $5,000, and we're all going to be really, really rich. And these guys just don't get it. What's happened in our sector is way more than metal prices. Mm -hmm. When I think back in 2001, when the gold market and the metals market started going up, between 2001 and 2010, all kinds of companies were financed. Mm -hmm. Most of them were crap. I'm saying this openly and honestly, and most people, when you confront them, agree with them, but no one will say it on a public forum. But most of them were crap. And I think that a large problem is that we didn't have the right number of geoscientists across the board to deal with the projects that we were taking on. And So do you mean that it's the type of exploration we might have been doing or development we might have been doing would have been more technically challenging and hence we didn't build up that technical skill set? No, because we were in a recession from really the better part of 1980, 81, 82, all the way to 2001. People weren't going to geology, mining engineering, metallurgical engineering. That's right. All of the skill sets they need, they weren't graduating the right number of people. While we had some great senior experienced engineers, but when you look at the 25-year-old crowd and the 55-year-old crowd, there's a gap and it's missing. And what happened was, is we were taking young people and giving them too much responsibility too quickly. And they weren't being well supervised. And a lot of mistakes were made. And, and it's not just mistakes made by the engineers. I don't want to throw it all on the engineers. I would say the financial community made huge mistakes. Mm-hmm. When I was young, I got to watch a, a great mine get developed. It was called the Demogamy Mine. Mm-hmm. They started this thing at 1,500 tons a day. And now it's uh, the Lorone Mine. It's the flagship mine for Agni Eco Eagle. Yeah. Same thing you guys could say for Olympic Dam in Australia. It's been expanded, expanded. Building a mine small and expanding it is a form of de-risking that mine. Yeah, that's right. But what we saw in the last cycle was we saw multi-billion dollar projects that were going to be built that way right at the get-go. And that's a mistake. Just because you make something work in a lab doesn't mean it's going to work the same way in the field. And if you kind of take the view that we're not very good at forecasting what type of conditions we're going to have, it is a big gamble to build these big things. So why not start off small and go modular? People wanted that. They wanted it right away. And I think a lot of projects got killed by scale, by Mm -hmm. too much scale. And uh, Do you think too much scale too quickly? That was the problem? They wanted to build something big too quickly. And what do you think was the basis for that? Is it just because they wanted to maximize revenue from day one or try to get as much returns out of it as possible? I think a lot of pressure came from investors saying, let's hit the ball out of the park right now. Yep. And one of the problems in this industry is that the capital that's financing the industry doesn't have the right term on it. Yeah. Okay. So if hedge funds are buying this expecting a three, six month, one, one or two year return on a project that's going to take six or seven years to develop it, it doesn't make sense. So there's a lot of pressure coming from the investors saying you got to move this thing along fast. And then the companies are trying to do what their shareholders are saying to do. And pretty much everybody's tripping over each other. So there is this, I think, challenge in the fact that the investors are becoming more short term about what they want, the returns that they want. They want bigger and bigger returns on a shorter and shorter time scale. And the point that you made, I think, is a very valid one in that you can see the downstream effect of that on our industry, where people are wanting to go big and try to maximize as quickly as possible. And maybe that's why they rush through some projects as well, right? They rush through some projects. I've seen people try and build a mine off of a PEA, which is almost always a disaster. The most expensive words in mining is someone says, I think I can save you a step here. Like it's almost every time you just want to, you know, back up slowly and get out of that room. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so in your article, there's one section which I like, and I'm just going to read it. The elephant in the room is that the devaluation of mining companies cannot be explained by the commodity price. Instead, it is dictated by the self-inflicted mistakes of a commodity boom 
and the irresponsible management of these assets. Yeah. So this goes back to, I guess, your kind of premise is that we seem to blame market conditions, but I think we probably need to have a good look at ourselves about what we've done wrong. When you step outside of the mining world and you start talking to pretty serious investors in other sectors or generalist investors and you start asking them about mining and they kind of chuckle <laughs> and say, yeah, 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 my clients don't have the risk tolerance for that. What they're really saying when you get down to it is we've invested in mining and we've lost money and we don't understand how this market works. There's too many places where we can invest our money to bother. Mm -hmm. And that should bother everyone in the mining industry. Serious investors don't take us seriously. Mm -hmm. And every time generalists come into our market, they get their head handed to them. So there's this expectation that, oh, the price of gold's going up. They're going to come back. And what people don't realize is if they want to levered gold play, they can structure a product with gold and debt that creates levered gold and has no operational risk at all. Yeah, that's right. And that's something I think that you mentioned that has changed now as well, is that people can get this exposure without necessarily buying shares in junior companies. They can get it through different means now. And maybe even the fact that they can get that risk tolerance by investing in cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin. There's other high risk things that they can put their money in now as well. But here's the thing. A great mining asset is a great mining asset. The de-risking of a great mining asset can make you huge returns and huge amounts of money. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's still a great sector to invest in. So from our point of view, we see this as an opportunity. So even though the article was written originally out of the whole frustration of what's wrong, we can give you suggestions on how we think the industry should change. We actually don't think the industry is going to change. Mm -hmm. But we can change. Like, we yep. can change in how we do our investing to make sure that we don't fall for the, the traps out there. Do you think that investors now are wanting something different out of the junior end of the market? It depends who. I mean, certainly there are a lot of investors that are just saying, you know, I just came from the cannabis space and now I want to speculate in the mining space. And great, good on them. They don't need me to do that. They can go and speculate and they just want drill holes and they can go have a ball. But if investors want to invest in a project that's going to go from an early stage project to the advancement of a fully permitted project that requires capital to build and go and exploit and make a really good return, they're going to have to change their ways. They're not going to find that mm -hmm. as easily in the public market space. So if the premise now is that investors want a legitimate return, then a lot of that really relies on companies finding something and developing something. Do you think that's the modus operandi for a lot of companies still? Well, I think certainly the companies want to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody wants to spend their life just drilling holes. That's another problem is a lot of these companies, their stocks are so low, they'll say, I'll raise a couple million dollars and they'd basically drill a few holes and pay their salaries and move on. But they're in an infinite do loop because they can never get their project to the next level. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, which is always a problem. Sometimes it takes millions of dollars to actually take something through development. But then you look at the money that a lot of companies are raising is so small because of the market conditions. They're basically stuck in their loop where they're doing a little bit of work and then they have to go raise again, which dilutes the company. They do a little bit of work and then they dilute the company again. So that's not a great way for them to be realizing value out of this thing. That's true. So the great opportunity is you have these really interesting deposits out there. They're failed public companies mm -hmm. and they're in the public market domain, but they can't get from point A to the next point without things changing. Mm -hmm. For me, that's mana from heaven. That's exciting because we can go in there and work with them and do something and make a more significant investment. Mm -hmm. Of course, you need some buy-in because we need people on the ground to manage the assets. We're not going to go and do all that. But I think that there's lots of room to do good business where you advance everybody's interests and align everybody's interests. Mm -hmm. That was one of the other points in the argument is the interests that cost this industry are really poorly aligned. How so? What do you mean by that? You start with the brokers that are raising all the money. Mm -hmm. When a stockbroker trades a stock, so you say, I like this company, I want to go buy, you know, 100,000 shares on the market for 10 cents a share. The commission he's going to charge you for that is almost negligible. Mm -hmm. But if they go and do financing for a company, they charge a full 5% commission, they get broker warrants, sometimes they charge 6%. Mm -hmm. They make a lot more money raising money. So what you have is there's a real incentive for the brokers to be raising money. So there's an incentive to be promoting. But once they raise that money, a lot of these stocks go no bid and nobody cares. 
where are the guys that were promoting it? Well, they've been paid and they're not going to get paid by seeing the stock trade every day. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it creates a, a real problem. And I think I suggested in the article that they should hold back some of those commissions for trading. I know that's not going to happen. The, most of that money spent before it's gone. But it, it shows how the interests are misaligned. And I think that's a really good point that you make is that if you kind of dumb it down, then the best thing for the investor and the company is that they raise, say, $20 million and go to a program for three or four years. But the way the brokers are going to work, it's better for them to raise $5 million four times over an extended period of time, because that's what works best for them. They'll get paid every year. Correct. But, you know, I think the other side of it is, how do you say, what's the right number? So to me, what I try and do is I look at where is this company in its curve? Is it resource drilling? Is it med? Is there a study? You want to get it to that next level. And that's really the right amount of money to raise is let's raise an amount of money that's going to take it from point A to point B, which is the next level of de-risking. And if you can take that and have it executed properly, maybe you get a, a, a well-done PEA or a well-done report out of it. Maybe you crack the metallurgy. Maybe you get some pit ops that make some sense. That whatever that next step is, you get it. And then you argue you technically have something that's got more value proven up and less risk. So it should be easier to raise the next batch of money. At the end of the day, our goal should be to maximize value out of projects, which means that you have to take them through to development. So isn't the, the fundamental problem that we as an industry are probably working on too many projects that are never going to have a hope of getting there? That's probably always the case. I think the real problem is that we're not necessarily doing the right things with the right project. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you feel like the goal is just to raise money rather than how you spend the money. One of the things is that the investment bankers, they, they ring the bell when the deal closes. But for an investor, that bell is the starting point. You've just written your check. So for the banker, that deal, it's game over. The finish line's been crossed. We've got our payment. We can go yep. move on to the next deal. So that's the first phase of misaligned interest. The second phase is, you know, exactly what you mentioned. How do you prioritize the project? Mm -hmm. And to some extent, there's some projects that are being touted because that's the only one they need money and nobody else has agreed to let me raise the money, which isn't fair because everyone needs money. Mm -hmm. And I think a bigger problem right now is the competition for capital is so fierce that the conversation about what are the risks isn't an honest conversation. Yeah, that's all right. I mean, you mentioned the fact that if you're a company, you need to raise money. And right now, capital is tough. You have to have a project. So I think there's this catch-22 argument in that, well, we just got to have a project to raise money. Otherwise, we can't raise money. Well, what are the projects out there? And they may not be the best ones. Right? So you pick one up just because that's the only way you're going to raise money. No matter how small you raise or whatever it is, you hang your hat on that. No question. I remember the old promoting days, they talk about, you remember that old joke about cans of tuna and someone once opened it up and said there's sand in it. He said, well, that can of tuna is for trading. It's not actually for eating. And to some extent, some of the projects are like that, is that we'll put this project into this shell and we'll go raise a million dollars and we'll then work until we can find a real project. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we see that a lot. I mean, obviously, uh, we, we work hard to stay away from that. Yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of those things out there. <laughs> So one of the things I quite like that you mentioned here is the view from kind of the investor side. And you mentioned this thing about the inadequacy of information that is available across the line. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I'm glad you brought that up. Part of my background is over the years, I've run a mining company, mm -hmm. I've run an investment bank, and I've also, for the most part of my career, been an investor as well. I ran investment funds. So from that point of view, I've worn all these different hats over the years, and I see these conflicts very clearly. But what's very evident is we don't give the information required to make an intelligent decision. You know, if I ask an entrepreneur, who knows your business better than you? The entrepreneur says, nobody knows my business. It's my business. It's my life. It's what I breathe. It's what I do 24-7. But when you ask a shareholder of a mining stock, who owes this company better than you? The answer is everyone that's ever signed a CA with this company. <laughs> because right. you know they companies put out the information based on what they view as material. Yeah, that's all right. And it should be obvious to people that no deal in our industry gets done without a CA being signed and deep due diligence being done. Correct. Why is that? Why can't you take the publicly available information and do your due diligence based on that? And the answer is because everybody out there knows the publicly available information isn't good enough to make a good decision. So I don't know why it, I'm the only one bothered by this. I mean, I think it's a really, really good point. 
I mean, this is why like a lot of hostile deals do go kind of pear-shaped because you're making decisions based on publicly available information. Very, very, very rarely do you see a hostile deal on the mining side. Yeah, that's right. They used to see them. I remember what's that company? Uh, Western Mining came to yep. Canada and they spent a billion dollars in like three weeks. Yep. Six months later, they wrote it all off. That was in the 80s. Or, or, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Those were the last hostile deals you saw. But so from your perspective, do you think that the quality of public reporting has deteriorated over the last little while? You know, did it used to be good and it's bad or was it always bad? I don't know. I think that you have to understand the evolution of it is, you know, the 43101 reports were put in place after BRIEX mm -hmm. to, to avoid a fraud. And I think they've done a good job. And I think, you know, they've achieved that objective. Mm -hmm. But they're all the same report. If you go and look at a PEA done, 10 different PEAs, they're all the exact same report, same heading, same footer, same tables. It's, and that's the way they're designed. There's not a lot of latitude in how you can. That's right. They have to follow a yeah. template, essentially. Yeah. yeah. So I've always joked, if you took the best 43101 ever done and the worst one ever done, and you created this guru with Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch and all the great investors in the world, and you put these two documents on the table and said, I want you to tell me which is the best and which is the worst, and you can't take their phones away and take all their information, so you just have to read the documents, yep. they wouldn't have a clue. And the answer is, what makes one great and one bad isn't in the document. Did they wireframe the resource properly? Did they do enough density calculations? Did they do it right? There's so much technical data. You, you can't do that unless you actually go and look at some core, understand the geological model. How is this thing wireframed? Which method did they use? Is this a robust? What do all the geostatistics look like? And the engineering assumptions they have. You don't really get a sense out of the report. You have to kind of dig into it in the background to figure it out. A hundred percent. So it just strikes me that PEAs have become a best case scenario. And I think a PEA is plus or minus 40% and a feasibility study, I can't remember, was plus or minus 10%. Yeah. But have you ever seen the capital cost from a PEA to a feasibility study go down? I haven't. I've asked many people this question. It's very rarely, but if it's supposed to be plus or minus, yep. there should be a log normal distribution on both sides of a line, but it's always goes higher and, and yeah, higher. That's right. as, I mean, I had this conversation with someone, they kind of phrased it that they don't even bother looking at these because it's kind of like a brochure now, right? They just read the brochure to know a little bit about the project, but then they do their own work to figure out whether they believe any of the assumptions, any of the data in that report. Well, we still look at the reports because that'll give you the whole suite of questions. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of little rules of thumb we learn that we look at and you can see that the reports didn't pass the rule of thumb test and you have to say why. Yep. Sometimes there's good explanations and sometimes there isn't. Haven't companies just gamed the way of writing these reports? <laughs> Probably too harsh a word, but you know, the reality is the fight for capital is tough out there. Mm -hmm. You know, so they get a, a metallurgical test result that's really good. They want to make sure that gets reflected in the flow sheet, even though, you know, have they gone and done met work on every different zone in the deposit, every different geological type? As you get deeper, rocks often get more compact and metallurgy changes. These are things that need to be considered, but they're often not. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to name any names, but we looked at a feasibility study the other day, and it was called a feasibility study. And they had done something like two or three metallurgical samples. And the metallurgical samples weren't even taken from the orbit. They were taken from the inferred resource. And we're kind of scratching our heads saying, how can you even call this a feasibility study? <laughs> That's right. And, you know, metallurgy is one of the, the, the pet peeves because nobody does enough metallurgy. No, that's right. But isn't part of the problem there that investors go that we're not going to invest until you have a PEA or you have a feasibility study? And when companies don't have the money to do a proper feasibility, they are trying to pass something a lot more premature as an FS. Otherwise, they can't get access to the money. A PEA used to be what we would call the back of an envelope or, or even a scoping study. Mm -hmm. Kind of say, okay, well, we got this thing here. What do we need? What makes sense? And does it make sense that we have a thousand ton a day mine here? or Whatever you think makes sense. And then you think, okay, so if, if that's what's going to make sense to make an ore body, what do we then have to go and drill off? And that's not what a PEA is. A PEA has now become, you're right, a marketing document. Or even like a valuation document, which is the argument you make, right? It, it was never meant to be a valuation tool. I remember when Placer Dome, and I'll mention them because they don't exist anymore, they used to do these feasibility studies, and their feasibility studies had horrible internal rates of return but they would go and build the project. And what you learned as a young analyst following this company is that they threw every cost possible because their culture was, we're not going to miss this. 
So if they had a hundred million dollar mine to build, probably 20 million of the costs weren't real. Mm -hmm. They were just overestimations. So they would actually build a great mine off of a document that didn't get anybody that excited. Yeah. But you had to know their culture because when they went to their board, they actually could deliver it. You don't see that anymore. Right now, it's all about showing an IRR above 20%. Yeah. And so there's a lot of pressure to, to not spend capital. And I think to that extent, these documents don't necessarily serve the shareholders. Yeah, that's right. So the reason why I say the word game is because if the companies know what the investor is looking for, so they know exactly what they need to put on the table, otherwise it doesn't get interest. Well, the buzzword is people want an IRR above 20%. Yeah. And the truth of it is, if you actually knew 100% that you could deliver on that capital cost, 15% is a pretty good return when interest rates are at 1.5%. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they only want 20% because they're hoping to get 15 We were kind of talking about this before we started recording. Is part of the problem the fact that the management level in the industry isn't very honest with investors either? Wouldn't it be refreshing to hear a story that this is a project that I have. It's going to have, it has these pros, but it has these challenges. But these are the plans that we're going to put in place for the next couple of years to navigate those challenges. That's 100%. That's what we'd love to see. The word honest is... Uh... Because I don't think people are intentionally trying to be dishonest, but the game out there isn't to tell all the truth. Yeah, it's more of a game of like misinformation. I don't know of a single project that doesn't have an opposition. Mm -hmm. Now, often the opposition is very small and, and can't be navigated. And yet I don't know a CEO out there that's not saying the community loves us. <laughs> the community loves the project. <laughs> that's right. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the reality of it is there's always someone out there that doesn't love you and doesn't love the project. And it's not because there's necessarily anything wrong, but to some extent, anytime you're going to go build a mine, this is, a, this is one of my partners that have said this, is every mine's a bit of a social experiment. Mm -hmm. You're going into a society and you're saying, we're going to change your community. And hopefully we're going to change it for the better. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, truthfully, the right initial reaction should be a very tough negative reaction from a community. Because they want to know that you're going to do things right and they need to hold you to high standards so that you can execute because everybody wants the economic benefits of mining. It's just they don't want the negative environmental repercussions that can come if things aren't done properly. That's the trade-off, right? But it's not necessarily a trade-off. If you look at modern mining, it's not necessarily a trade-off. You know, we can engineer things where the environmental impact is minimal. There's always an environmental impact. Mm -hmm. We're moving rock. We're reshaping landscape. We're digging tunnels where there's going to be some tailings. But you can manage your environmental reclamation as you go. There's a lot of things that you can do to properly steward that. And in a lot of these societies, they have artisanal miners that don't do any of this stuff. You know, one of the fights we have to go out and fight as an industry is modern versus historical mining. Mm -hmm. because we're all on the defense because historically our industry has done a really poor job. Yeah, we're paying the price of legacy issues. Yeah, as a result, we're all like, it's great that it's a Canadian thing because we're all saying sorry all the time. But, you know, one of the segues into one of the other things I do, which is Laurentian University, the, the Goodman School of Mines, is just that. The special thing about Sudbury that you can fall in love with really quickly as a mining professional is that when you go to Sudbury, you find this community of something like 180, 200,000 people. They all live a very outdoors life. They go fishing, they go hunting, they go snowmobiling, cross-country skiing. Yet within an arm's throw, there's seven or eight mines and two smelters, and it's a major part of the community. Mm -hmm. And some of the research that's been done at Laurentian and the Goodman School, one of the stuff is done by a, a lady named Dr. Nadia Mikicha, and she documented the whole history of Sudbury. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when mining started in Sudbury, it was disastrous. There was a lot of environmental problems. Then they came back and they actually looked at it and figured out how do we fix this. And now she teaches a course on mine reclamation that we're getting converted to many languages and teaching in different countries all over the world. So that people can understand is that what's the value proposition the Canadian companies can bring is we know why you're concerned. We understand that. We've had the same problems as well, but we've learned over the years how to do things in a way that can be win-win for everybody. I think that's a really important point is that as an industry, I think we get held hostage by our past. But what we don't possibly get the credit for is that we've also learned from these mistakes of the past as well. And you would hope that we're not making those same mistakes now. And, and we're not. For the most part, we're not. But the whole concept of you know, understanding ESG and getting a social license is really important. 
And arguably probably becoming more important now. It's always been really important. I think it's becoming more important now because investors are now tuning in. Yeah, that's right. But the reality is anybody that's built a mine in the last 10 years, you can't build a mine without a social license. And without a social license, every community is concerned. So a lot of mining companies that have been active in building mines, we've already embraced all this stuff. Mm -hmm. We understand what you have to do to get a social license, how you have to work with communities and not against communities. When there's an activist in your community, that's a, a great opportunity to have a real proper dialogue. And that's why whenever you see a CEO that says, no, we have no issues, everybody wants the mind. You just know it's not the truth. Yeah, that's all right. And you, as you said before, if we can actually have that honest dialogue, I mean, I think a lot of people would still invest. But the perception is that if there's an opposition group, all the investors are going to run for the hill. Yeah, so we don't talk about that. So let's talk about that, right? So you're an investor in this space. Would you consider it a competitive advantage for a company that bucked the trend and was very honest about the challenges they faced? Would that be something that would be appealing to you as an investor? A hundred percent, because transparency is a very important value for me. So if a company came in and you know said, we're going to be transparent and here's our issue and here's our plan. I mean, you'd want to go and do enough work to make sure that their plan made sense. The environmental plans that they were putting in place were really best practices and that their issues were really more issues of emotion rather than science. Mm -hmm. And then you can go in and with time, work with the communities to let them understand the science in a way where they understand that there's a lot more benefits than there are risks. So as an investor in that scenario, you would have to be okay with a long-term commitment or long-term investment? From my end, if you're not prepared to put money in away for a long time when you invest in a mining stock, you shouldn't be investing. And that's part of the problem because when you spend your money on metallurgical testing, nobody ever got excited because you got the recoveries you'd hope to get. <laughs> so they all want you to just drill holes. <laughs> that's right. And you can drill and drill, but at some point you actually have to do the metallurgical testing. You have to do all of the density calculations and really understand the geology you're drilling and make sure you understand it uh, well enough to put into a proper resource model and then understand that you actually have something that's economic. You know, again, this is something we talked about before is that there is this concept of testing things in the lab to testing things at a little bigger scale and then testing things in real life. And that takes time. There's no replacement for that. You can do something in the lab and think that's exactly how you're going to smash it out of the park when you build it. And that's also why a lot of projects are best off to start small and then increase. Yep. And if you know you've got so much more resources and maybe you don't need the big IRR for the first project because you know you're going to get scale on the expansion and that first project's going to really de-risk the expansion. Yeah, you just need to wash your face at the start so you don't go broke, essentially. So you talked about the Goodman School of Mines at Laurentian. Can we talk a little bit about that? Tell us a little bit about it. Why were you interested in supporting a venture like this? Well, to be brutally honest, it wasn't me. It was my father. Mm -hmm. And my father set it up. And literally, he came to me one day and like we're walking by each other in the hall. He said, oh, by the way, you're now a professor at Laurentian University. What? <laughs> he said, yeah, it's part of our deal. I made you a professor. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm not a professor. I'm, a, I'm an executive in residence there. Yep. And as I've gotten more involved with the school, I'm now chairman of the Goodman School and very involved with them. It becomes a very important part of, of my life. I mentioned the environmental research, which is unbelievable. And I see huge potential for that because Sudbury as an ecosystem is, is one of the most minerally endowed places in the world. But I don't know if you've ever been to Sudbury. It's a beautiful place to go. It's a beautiful yeah. place to live. People I know that live there and move out, they all go back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think any of our listeners, if you want to see pictures of Sudbury from like the 20s, 30s, 40s, and now it looks completely different. It didn't look good. So Sudbury is, it's kind of the mecca for mining. Mm -hmm. And as a school, they can take anyone out to go see a mine tour, to go see some, like you're right there. It offers all that. But it's more than that. It's a bilingual city that revels in their bilingualism. They've got uh, a lot of respect and good agreements and good relations with all of the native communities around there. It's kind of the ecosystem for, for what mining should be. Mm -hmm. At the same time, to me, the greatest challenge facing the mining industry is the lack of young graduates coming out. I mean, we got to recognize, I mean, Robert Friedland, I don't know if he's talking here, he's not wrong, is that the, the solution to global pollution and global warming is battery metals, fuel cells, which require metals. All of these solutions require mining solutions. So if you think that we're really going to de-oil and gas our societies, 
what's going to happen is all of those things you're going to go off of are going to be funded by mining. So we're actually entering into the age of mining. And if we're going to enter into the age of mining, we need a, a lot more better educated people. And we've been way behind the curve in educating. And so the Goodman School is unique in that we don't offer any programs. And there's the Harkwell School of Earth Sciences, which does a wonderful job. The Barty School of Engineering also does a wonderful job. And you know, what we've kind of said at the Goodman School is that to do a proper mining education, when you talk to any CEO in a mining company, they would probably tell you they spend 90% of their time doing things they were never trained to do. And we say that our goal at Laurentian is to make it Canada's mining university, and the Goodman School is what's going to do that. It's what's going to be teaching ESG courses to the geologists and the engineers. It's going to be working with the Indigenous Studies courses to actually bring how you work with Native relations. You know, we, we've given some money to the environmental group to get some courses on environmental remediation. We actually do something called the Goodman Gold Challenge every year. This was actually one that I'm very involved with. I was invited to do a coach the case study team. And I said, okay, great. I'm going to go work with these students. It's going to be fun. And as I got there, the professor who coaches the team said, I need you to, quite frankly, I need you to be a bit of an, an ass. I said, what do you mean? He said, I want you to really be tough on these kids. I said, this is kind of my volunteer work. I, I don't want to be mean. Yeah. He said, look, if you don't mean, if you're not mean to them, they'll get destroyed by the judges at the case conference study. So we had the two-hour session of coaching. I did my job. And so at the end of it, I said, you know what? I'm not really this mean. I'm really playing a role. Let me buy you a couple of pitchers of beer. They were all of, of age. And so we all went to the pub, and I, I bought a couple of pitchers of beer, and we, we drank some beer. And we started talking, saying, you know, the problem isn't you guys. The problem is these cases are ridiculous. What you need in the mining industry is a CEO. He pitches you his company, and you, you meet with many CEOs, and you, then you say, which one are you going to buy and why? That was the creation of the Goodman Gold Challenge. And what we do is we have students come from somewhere anywhere between eight and 12 universities, teams of four, and uh, we usually get three CEOs. And usually we mix them up. You know, we usually get a development company, an exploration company, and uh, one that's in construction or has a mine operating. And uh, we have some judges. And so each team, we go to the big room and each, each CEO presents his company or her company. And then we have one-on-ones where each student group meets with each CEO for a one-on-one. -on -one. And then each student group meets with the judges. And then at the end of it, we have a big gala and the, each member of the winning team gets an ounce of gold. That's a great challenge. I, I think you're kind of teaching the skills that are really applied, kind of the real world skills. It's called experiential learning. And the motivation behind was really let's create something that's more like real life. Mm -hmm. But it's an incredible thing. And on two occasions, I've actually had students come to me and say, th this last one, this guy was almost panicked. He was like, I'm in fourth year. I've got a job when I graduate. It's a good job. And I never understood this finance side. I love this. I love this. This is what I want to do. Should I quit my job? And I said, no. I said, go and get your professional engineer. You're only going to become more valuable as time goes on and come back. But he was really, you yeah. could see that he, he had been strongly impacted by this three days of his life. Oh, I think that's great. I mean, I think if there's any program that allows people to get a much more rounded view on what this industry is, not just the technical side, but the non-technical side, which is becoming more and more important. Yeah, some of them are teams of four mining engineers or four geologists. Some of them have teams of a business student, a geologist, a mining engineer. And so you can see that they're, they're, they're thinking it through to cover the different skills. And it's great for everyone because because I can tell you that I've learned something every time. We've done this for four years now, and I've learned something every time. I tell you what, it sounds like a great podcast episode for us. And at, at Dundee, we've hired one of the students. One of them's working for us. So That's great. Before we kind of get to the end of the interview, I want to go back to some of the stuff that we were talking about before. So there's a lot of things that we've talked about that could be different in the industry. How do we go about changing it? Who has responsibility for doing it? What do we need to do? I don't know if we can change it. I thought about that one a lot. It would be nice to think that we can. I mean, I know I can change how I behave. And what we're doing at Dundee is we've put together a very strong technical team. And when we look at something that we think looks interesting, we'll sign a CA and do a deep dive technical review and we'll make a proposal to a company if we want to invest in them. And you're, you're not going to get it right all the time, but at least you'll make better decisions. Um but how do we change the whole industry? The whole industry has to want to change. And, you know, I think what's going to force change is the fact that the general investor isn't going to show up because they're not going to keep coming back and saying, well, I know I lost a lot of money last time and yeah, things look good. I'll give it another yeah. shot. It's not that, you know, this time will be different. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the, <laughs> those are the scariest words. 
But the industry does have to change. And I think I've highlighted the, you know, the, the bot deal I don't think is good for the industry. I know a lot of my broker friends are going to uh, disagree with me. But the problem with the bot deal is that these are pop, become popularity contests. Mm -hmm. So you take a, a company around, they tell a great story, they present really well, and you know, they, they stimulate the hand-to-wallet reflex, as Robert Friedman likes to say. And uh, next thing you know, they, they've just raised a whole bunch of money on a bot deal. But has anybody done any real due diligence? The brokerage firm has an analyst, but he's still looking at the same public information that we've already said isn't great information. That's right. I'm, I'm sure he or she is doing the best they can. For the listeners, can you just explain a little bit quickly about what is a bot deal? Because I think this is quite important. Okay, a bot deal is a very important financing done in Canada. And as companies maintain their public disclosure, they can be called pop issuers. And as being a pop issuer, it means that all of the information contained in the prospectus that's usually attached to a financing is on the web in your annual information form. And so you do a short form prospectus and you can actually do a bot deal financing where the broker can say, we're prepared to buy 5 million shares of your stock at five bucks. And your board says, yes, that deal is done. And then it's on the broker to actually make sure that they can sell that deal. And so these deals happen quite quickly. Then the brokers are making calls and very often they'll have a marketing call at four o'clock. At four o'clock, they're calling all of their clients saying there's a hot new issue. You know, the stock closed at six bucks. We just did a deal at five bucks. Are you in or are you out? And you better move quick because it's going fast. We haven't seen them in this cycle yet, but you create this momentum where investors kind of all of a sudden now they have a gun to their head. The stock's trading at six. They just had good news release. I met them. They're great guys. They tell a very convincing story. But have you done your homework? Have you, have you ticked all the boxes you want to? In most cases, the answer is no, but the clock's ticking. And so they create a lot of pressure. It's kind of like the FOMO reflex that they're trying to create. Well, and, and they do a good job of that. In a really hot market, these deals get done. Lots of them get done. And they're very profitable. And they're good for the industries because it means the industry can access capital quickly. They're very good for the Canadian industry because we're the only ones that seem to be able to do this on a regulated point of view. But they're not good for the investor. They're putting the gun to the investor's head. And at the end of the day, I know a lot of investors will agree with me. A lot of brokers will hate this. And a lot of brokers are saying there are no bot deals anymore anyways. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, the other person walks away. So, you know, part of what will change it is for investors to say, we're not going to look at bot deals anymore. So if all of your clients said, we're not going to look at bot deals anymore. That goes extinct. <laughs> that goes extinct. But a lot of them know how to game the system too. Yeah, that's fine. Uh... If the bot deal wasn't there, it would force the brokers to want to do a lot more work because if raising money for a company meant you had to take them on this big, long road show, and you'd think twice before doing it. So maybe that would force everybody, kind of align everybody's interest in that if I'm going to have to invest that much time into it. Whereas when there's a bot deal, and the, the, one of the rules of bot deals, you're not allowed pre-marking a bot deal. But everyone is determined that if I take a company that openly says they have a $10 million budget for next year, and they got a million dollars in the bank around, nobody thinks that's pre-marketing a bot deal. <laughs> Where are you going to get the other $9 million from? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that there's a role here for more regulators? Is there something that can be pushed by them to make it a lot more transparent? I actually think the regulators have done a pretty good job. I think it's up to the industry. Shareholders need to ask the right questions and they need to really insist that they can get their due diligence done. I do think that companies should give more information easier to investors. I don't know what they're hiding. Do you think in the future there could be the point where companies make all of their technical data available? That would be awesome. That would be really good. But you'd still need to actually go to site, mm -hmm. look at the core and say, is this geological interpretation right? Yep. That's what people forget is that we're just interpreters. If we look at these drill holes, which are small little pinpricks into the earth, and we're trying to make an interpretation. Because I know you're a geologist. Every interpretation, there could be more than one explanation on how the dots fit together. But I think that's the value step, right? Two people can look at the same thing and one can see a lot of value and the other can't. And that's the tough part about this business. As someone we used to say is that if you had five geologists in a room, you'd have 10 solid opinions. That's right. <laughs> yeah, at least 10, I should say. But that's exactly the point is I think that there has to be this kind of maturity on the investor side to be able to discern good and bad information or good and bad interpretation. Maybe there's a role for 
kind of technical brokers in the middle, which is kind of what you guys are doing. You've built a technical team that evaluates the merits of the project. But we don't, but we don't share that with it. We just share it with ourselves. That's right. So do you think there could be a component of peer review or a second review party? Peer reviews are done in all mid-sized companies. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that could actually fall on the board. So I'm glad you, you pointed that. I think I said it in the article, but a peer review is a great thing. And so why couldn't you, if you had SRK do the study, yes. why wouldn't you show it to Roscoe Postal and say, do a peer review? And they would read it and they would actually write you a letter saying, we see some risk in your capital cost because this other project 20 miles away is about the same size and it was built at a much higher capital cost. You need to actually explain why the capital cost estimate is different. And that could be done at the board level mm -hmm. where you can actually say we've got a, a proper peer review and that's given us a whole bunch of questions at the end of this in which we got to go do some work on to make sure we got it right. And like what a world that would be from a transparency perspective. Well, a lot of A lot of guys do the peer reviews. They just don't talk about it. That's right. You know, we kind of circle back to companies feel that information going out the door is too risky. So let's control as much as we can. And they feel that the only material information is positive information. That's right. I think that's a really good point. Towards the end of our interview, so we always ask our guests two questions at the end. The first one is, what is something, could be an idea, concept or behavior that you think needs to die in our industry that we need to get rid of? You know, mining is a really hard industry. And we see a lot of arrogance out there. Arrogance. Yeah, now, humility is a great thing because <laughs> we're, all, we're all just one screw up away from being on the bottom again. So, <laughs> yeah. But if I could uh, say it different, the, the words that are my pet peeve that really set me off in a mining meeting is when guys talk about all the value they've created. It drives me nuts because... My argument is we don't create value in this industry. The value is there. You know, you can see a million ounce deposit and then you go and develop it and you say, well, I bought this deposit for nothing and look at what I've created. I've created all this value. You haven't created the value. You've enabled the value. And we need to understand that the process isn't about creating, it's about de-risking. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of my pet peeves. If I never heard another management group get up there and talk about all the value they've created. John, you, you're going to have no friends by the end of this interview. Well, when you're worried about catching uh, a coronavirus, it's probably good that you have no friends left. So. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> all right, so conversely and last question, what is something that you think we should maintain at all costs? Something that you think is fundamental to our DNA? I think when I look back at Dundee Precious Metals, when we really started achieving our success, it really came when we did our mission, vision, and values. And we put these values in place. And our values, I, I wrote them out, safety, dignity and respect, environmental responsibility, community investment, continuous improvement, and transparency. And what that does, when you take those values and you define them and you go through each one and then you communicate them across an organization, it means that everybody in that organization understands what the company stands for. And I correlate this to years ago, I went to Omaha with my father to see Warren Buffett. And someone got up and said, you've got something like 20 or 30, some crazy number of employees working in the Berkshire Hathaway group. How do you and Charlie manage them all? And Warren said, we don't. We just try and make sure that we've got the culture and the values right and let them run and adhere to that. So I think that's something a lot of mining companies that actually have done a good job with the corporate values and the way they do that. And I think that's really important, especially as you start tackling projects that are in different countries and different jurisdictions and maintaining that is a good thing. I think that's a pretty good spot to end on. Thanks a lot for joining us, John. This was great. Thank you. Exploration Radio is brought to you by Ahmad Salim and Steve Beresford. This episode was produced by Ahmad Salim and Michael Carter. Edited by Humayun Mir and recorded live at the 2020 PDAC conference in Toronto, Canada. If you would like to know more about this podcast, then check out explorationradio.com or you can follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. If you like this podcast, then consider becoming a sponsor to help us continue producing more of this content. You can email us on info at explorationradio.com to find out more about sponsorship packages. Until next time, let's keep exploring.